I pray that the Lord will help us to find the truth in this segment of Scripture today and properly apply it to our lives, beginning, first of all, with me. In Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 17, is a segment of Scripture that gives us principles and what to expect from a godly leader. It deals with three things. That's money, power, and pleasure. Money, power, and pleasure. As we look at the news and watch what's happening in our country today and positions of leadership, behind the scenes are those three principles that work in the lives of individuals, money, power, and pleasure. The conflict that's going on in our government today, uh, parties that are opposing each other, and lawsuits by the millions and the zillions, and the hatred and the animosity behind the scenes, it's those same three things, power, pleasure, and money. Those three things, money, power, and pleasure, money, power, and pleasure, you see it as the motivating factor in all of those situations. So this segment of Scripture is focused on a time for the future when Israel would come into the land that God had promised them, and he says that he knows that they're going to want to choose a king. It seems to be in contradiction in this segment of Scripture that God's giving them approval and actually giving them rules on how to choose a king, when clearly in other passages of Scripture, God says he doesn't want them to have an earthly king. And in fact, at this point in their history, God has established a form of government where he's in charge of the government and he communicates what he wants for them through the prophets and the priest. Um, I think that God used principles in this segment of Scripture for kings that are valid principles for those of us who are in the kingdom of God today and claim to be followers of Jesus. So, as I've noted, it may seem to be a contradiction when you read other passages of Scripture, but here we are in verses 14 and 15. God gives Moses the prophecy about the fact that they will come to a place in a time when they'll say, we want a king for ourselves, and he says, here's what you need to do. Verse 16 and 17, the rules for the king to follow. First of all, when you choose a king, he won't multiply horses for himself. So horses are not just beasts of burden, but they are an image of warfare. So in our day and in our society, it would be, he shall not gather for himself tanks and battleships and airplanes and deadly missiles. That would be the analogy that we'd use in our day and in our time. And that's the picture, the image of he shall not gather for himself horses. And the whole point of not building up the military is not to not have a military or defense for the country, but that he didn't put his faith and his trust in his military, that his faith and his trust would be in the Lord. The second thing is he was not to multiply wives for himself, and many wives was a picture of self-indulgence and power, and it was an issue of image around the other kings and the other kingdoms around them. So kings would have multiple wives, and that word would get out. The other kings would hear it, and they say, "Well, they've got so many wives; they must be, they must have wealth, they must have power to be able to support that many wives and all the children that go along with it." Um, so God did not want His people to be self-indulgent and worried about the status in the eyes of other people. Second, and then thirdly, nor shall he greatly multiply silver or gold for himself. So he wasn't to put his trust or his focus on building great wealth. Uh, money is power to people. People that have a lot of money think that they don't have to follow the rules, they don't have to follow the laws, and in fact they do get away with things. Uh, we find judges are bought off and lawyers are bought and paid for, and people with a lot of money can uh, grease the right palms and get away with things that other individuals who don't have money don't get away with. So it, it's an issue of um, power. Money creates power to people that have it. And God says you shouldn't put the focus of your life on building great personal wealth. Now, the logical reason for this and these guidelines is stated clearly in the passage of Scripture, just simply these words, lest his heart be turned away. So God doesn't want an individual's heart to be turned away by any of these three things. Uh, now, they're not evil in and of themselves, just so that you understand. Military power was needed to protect them, but not too much. One wife was all any man needed, and some personal comforts was, again, the, uh, acceptable, but not too much. Balance, you see, was the power for those, was the um, key to those powerful men remaining loyal, first of all, to the Lord. 
it wasn't wrong to have wealth, but to be focused on wealth would cause you to be distracted from your trust in the Lord. Um, God wanted his people, his leaders, to be loyal to the Lord before anything else. So, you remember a guy named Solomon? Of course, most people who are Bible scholars remember a guy named Solomon. Well, he broke all these rules. He had 40,000 chariots that were pulled by horses. So, if he had 40,000 chariots, and uh, the indications are that he may have had upwards of 80,000 horses. Uh, historical records indicate that he ordered and uh, imported horses on a regular basis from uh, down in Egypt. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Uh, I don't have to explain to you what a concubine is. And his wives, the scripture says, turned his heart away from God. His wives turned his heart away from God. Well, no wonder, because each of those women had influence on him. But here's what he did. He made alliances with these women's fathers. So he had all these neighboring kings and princes and uh, little individual groups and by making agreements with those kings taking their daughters as a princess and having them in his house he was essentially agreeing not to wage war against them and they were agreeing not to wage war on him but uh, in an effort to try to please these women and keep them happy they were all influencing him he started building idols to their false gods in direct contradiction to what he, he had been raised to do and taught to do and what God was requiring of him so the scripture says his wives turned his heart away from God. Now think about this. If such a man was wise, and the scripture declares him to be the wisest man that ever lived, if he could fool himself and justify doing things he shouldn't do or deceive himself in such situations, how do we think we will escape or how do we think leaders in our day will escape? And I, I just want to ask, can I say this without hurting anybody's feelings? These are the same ways that our leaders today fall. I guess it doesn't matter whether your feelings are hurt or not. Power, pleasure, and money snare men today, including you, including me, if we don't keep our guard up and pro protect ourselves by not being foolish enough to be deceived about these areas. Power, pleasure, and money are snares for all of us if we're honest. I don't believe God has changed his mind about his expectations of leaders. I think he still has the same expectations of those who would be spiritual leaders. And if God hasn't changed his mind, I don't think we should uh, forget that we need to be self-aware and guard against self-deception. You know, Solomon deceived himself, and he found out all too late that he had deceived himself. One of the saddest pictures that I see in Scripture is those last days of King Solomon and he writes vanity vanity all is vanity in spite of all the wealth in spite of all the opportunity that God had provided him he ends up his life saying everything's worthless there's no point to it there's just no point to my existence what a sad picture the most important rule though that's here for the king or the leader then and now is this requirement to write his own copy of the law and of course we're not under a requirement to write our own copy of the law but he had to write his own copy of the law he had to present it to the priest to make sure it was written correctly can you imagine handwriting the entire law from beginning to the end you know why would God require such a tedious task well this shows that God wanted the word of God to be on the heart of the rulers he wanted every king in a sense to be a scribe where he would write out handwrite what he had read and what he saw because you remember better what you take the time to hand write out and it was the principle it shall be with him he shall read it all the days of his life so the word of God was to be a constant in the life of that individual a constant companion a constant guide to every situation that came up it says that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of the law you know, he needed the Word of God. The more responsibility he had, the more he needed the Word of God. We need the Word of God. The more responsibility we have, the more we need the Word of God. And we need to be able to depend on the truth of the Word of God. It is implied in this section of Scripture that keeping the Word of God near our mind and our heart helps to keep us away from sin. You also need to note that sin will keep you away from the Word of God. You ask yourself, what is it that's keeping me from reading and studying the Word of God? A large percentage of 
us will recognize that it's our inclination and our leaning towards sinful things that keeps us from gravitating to and learning and ingesting and making the Word of God a part of our lives. So we must note that sin will keep us away from the heart of God. Now finally, staying in the Word of God would have the impact of keeping the king humble. The scripture says that his heart may not be lifted up. See, the Bible diligently read carefully studied, properly applied, is the most powerful means to keep us humble. Because it's a constant reminder that we have a monarch that's higher than us. You know, if our president would constantly read the Bible, he might be reminded he has a monarch higher than himself. If our senators would constantly read the Bible, they might be reminded they have a monarch higher than themselves. If our congressmen and our mayors and our governors of our states would read the Word of God, they might be reminded that there is a power that is above them. The Word of God teaches people to fear the Lord and to be careful to observe the words of the Lord. We all need the Word of God. And the more power and authority that we have, the more we need the Word of God. Well, what's the point of all this study in this segment of Scripture, and how is it relevant to our lives? Well, let me see if I can simplify it. We can conclude that God gives us principles here. And if those principles are good enough for an Old Testament king or a leader, then they ought to be good enough for us too. Amen to that. So first, we should also study the Word of God. The king had to study it all the days of his life. So we show respect for God, for the Word of God, by studying and reading the Word of God. And we need to obey the Word of God. Remember, even in the New Testament, in John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So we need to obey the Word of God. So reading the Word of God would keep him aware of its content, and the repetition of the Word of God would stress the importance of obedience to it. We have to remember that obedience is our evidence. Obedience is our evidence. Obedience is our evidence of loving God. It's also our evidence that we have experienced a saving knowledge of one true God. Reading it, lastly, is designed to help us to avoid sin and its consequences. One verse of Scripture says, I will hide thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee, O God. So obedience is the evidence of loving God and that we've experienced a saving knowledge of one true God. Reading it helps us to avoid sin and the consequences of sin. So the king's knowledge and obedience to the word of God would enable him not to turn aside from following the word of God. So for us it's true. Our knowledge and our obedience to the word of God helps to enable us to stay faithful and not turn to the right or the left concerning the word of God. Now for the kings there was a promise uh, directly associated with reading and obeying the Word of God. The kings were told that their rule would be extended to his family and to the generations that would follow. Now, of course, we're not expecting to be kings in that same sense, but we do receive the promise of a relationship with God in our children, for our children and their children. And Christian leaders today have to follow the example of Jesus who came as a servant, never magnifying himself, Rather, he washed his disciples' feet and ended up sacrificing his own life for all human beings to ransom them from sin. And Titus 1.6 points out also that faithful leaders are expected to have children who are faithful to the Lord as well. The earmark of a good spiritual leader, whether in the pew or in the pulpit today, is whether or not their children follow the Lord. I know there are always exceptions to that, and every time I make that statement, there are people that say, I did right, I raised my children right, and they've gone wild. Well, listen, the Word of God has this promise. If you bring up a child the way they should go, when they're old, they'll not depart from it. You may not live to see with your own eyes, but I've lived long enough to see people who raised their kids right, died and went on to heaven, and after they died, their children turned around their lives and got back into a relationship with the Lord. You know, this promise of raising children that love the Lord is a self-promise.
fulfilling prophecy in, in and of itself it ensures the blessing of God continues to the next generation so be faithful to teach your children and incorporate Christian ideas and concepts and principles in their life if you reflect with me for just a minute on our country today I want to ask you some questions and think about this you think about our country is it full of arguments pro and con about what's morally right and wrong? I've never seen a time when there was more conflict and controversy and hatred and animosity, visible hatred, hatred and animosity about what's morally right or wrong. Uh, I, are people pushing their agenda for easy access to abortion? Are the movies and the school lessons directing social indoctrination into our children and into us? Are we being called dumb, backward, and uneducated if we say we believe in the Bible and creation instead of evolution? Let me ask you this. Do, do we have leaders who we can say are examples of leadership the way God demands for a leader to be in the Bible? If you think about this, 43% of our Congress are lawyers. 60% of our senators are lawyers. That's 81 Republicans, 123 Democrats who are lawyers, and they're the ones writing our laws. Forty of them are millionaires, and the average salary of all of them is $174,000 a year. Now, can people this rich even identify with a common man on the street? If God warns about money, power, and pleasure, you have to ask yourself, what's the motive behind these rules and laws that are being written for us? You have to ask yourself, do any of the people who are in positions of leadership in our country today fit the pattern that God established for leaders based on Deuteronomy 17? So you, you can't help but ask the question, you know, why do you think these people became lawyers? Was that a noble calling? Why do you think they wanted to be in government to start with? Was there, was there a motive, desire for power or money or pleasure? Now I know, I know, I know what people are thinking. There are a few lawyers who are God-fearing people. But I think it's worth consideration that some of the problems that we're having as a country are due to the fact that it takes a lawyer to write and understand our laws. May we be reminded today as we study this passage of Scripture that there are things that corrupt the wisest people. It corrupted the wisest man that ever lived. That's money, power, and pleasure. And if we're honest, if we're honest, it can corrupt us too. Those are the things that we're most likely to be subject to, to be tempted to. So how do we fight that? Well, we can't leave the door open to compromise or we will be corrupted with any th of those three topics. How do we fight that? Well, we have to keep God close to our hearts. How do we keep God close to our hearts? We can do so by keeping His Word close to our hearts. We keep our balance in the winds of a society's effort to cause us to accept any view besides God's view if we keep God's view in mind in our heart. Listen to me. This is my last statement to you. The only safe place in the storm of life is next to the cross of Christ with our feet firmly planted on the Word of God. Let me say it again and send you away with God's blessing. The only safe place to stand in the storms of life is next to the cross of Jesus with our feet firmly planted on the Word of God. May you read the Word of God. May you study the Word of God. May you be obedient to the Word of God. This is my prayer for you in Jesus' name.